my, my wife pointed out that one of the things she loves about Amazon is you can look back at your purchases, yeah. and it's a really great reflection of what's going on in your life at the time based on what you're buying. And it occurred to me that the reverse is also true, that the e-commerce journey that everybody probably in this room has gone on uh, mirrors what you and Amazon have gone through first, only selling books and now selling everything. And so we've all kind of gone on that journey together. And I looked back at my purchase history, and in 2004, I bought exactly one thing on Amazon, it was a book. By 2006, I had a 500% increase in purchases, four books and one Gillette razor. And which I, I use tonight, and um, hopefully a new one. Yeah, the new one. Yeah. And then by 2015, a year we had just gotten married, moved into a home, uh, got dogs. We bought everything for our, our dogs. We bought a TV, bought a snowblower, bought allergy medicine, peanut butter. I looked these things up. Literally everything. Uh, four days a week ordering. And so the question is, at what point did you realize you'd have the scale of success with Amazon going from books to where you are now as a company? Well, I have a question for you. In 2004, what, do you know what book it was you bought? I, I, I do remember. It was Writing Screenplays That Sell. And it did uh, not... I, mean, it I was going to say, how did that work out? <laughs> that, my, my do you want your money back? I could, I could ret you return I'll, re I'll take it back. Because that did not work out um, for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep my day job. But the, so your question is, you know, did I kind of anticipate what would happen over the last 22 years? at Amazon? And the answer is, God, no. So, you know, Amazon started as a very small company. Um, it was me and a few other people. I was driving all the packages to the post office myself in my 1987 Chevy Blazer. Um, and uh, th when I raised money for Amazon, I had to raise a million dollars, which I raised from 22 different investors, $50,000 each. They got 20% of the company for, uh, for the million dollars. And um, uh, it was a, 40 people told me no. So I had to take 60 meetings to get 20 yeses. The first question was always, what's the internet? And I had to walk through that. And this was 1994, early 95. And so did I anticipate, you know, fast forward to today and, and the current version of it? No. It has been one, foot in front of the other, and I think that that is true for most businesses, um, where you kind of proceed adaptively, it's step by step, you, you figure it out, you have a success, and then you kind of double down on that success, and you figure out what, what else you can do, what customers want. And everything we've done and all the success we have is at its root, primarily due to the fact that we have put customers first. So those few people are probably kicking themselves now that... Well, it's very interesting. The 40 people who did not invest, um, it's kind of a Anybody? study in human nature. Um, I'm in touch with a few of them still, and um, some of them take it in great stride and have, they recognize that they actually have ridiculously happy lives. Others of them actually cannot talk about it. It's just too, it is actually just too painful. Um, that's human nature, and some people are better at rolling with the punches. I would be in the do not talk about it camp, probably. Um, <laughs> but speaking of talking, I have the privilege of being able to talk to a lot of people in Washington about all of our member companies. And Amazon is one where I think people have a very different idea of what Amazon is. Some people see you as an e-commerce yeah. company or a retailer. Others see you as an innovative tech company. You have Amazon Web Services, and you have original content, and you have uh, uh, Alexa and so many other things. How should we be thinking about Amazon? Yeah, I do get, uh, uh, that, that is uh, something that people get confused about sometimes. What is Amazon? We do su such a diverse array of things uh, from producing original content at Amazon Studios to uh, Amazon Web Services uh, where we sell, you know, startups and enterprises, you know, computing infrastructure uh, to the things that most people know about, which is our, our consumer offering uh, where we deliver things in little brown boxes. And these things seem so disparate. How is it that we're doing all of them? And the common thread, and really what it is, is it's an approach. We have a very distinctive approach um, that we have been honing and refining and thinking about for 22 years. And it's really just a few principles um, that we use as we go about these activities. The, at the very top of the list is one I've already mentioned, but you'll probably hear it 10 times throughout tonight because it's so central. And it is 
customer obsession. It's customer obsession instead of, for example, competitor obsession or business model obsession or product obsession or technology obsession. There are many ways to center a business. And, um, and by the way, many of them can work. I know um, and, and, and have friends who lead very competitor-obsessed companies and those companies can be successful. You know, that's not a bad strategy. Um, you have to be really good at close following. You uh, identify winners when you watch, you watch your competitors very carefully. If they latch on to something that's working, you duplicate it as quickly as possible. It's a very good strategy in some ways because you don't have to go down blind alleys um, if you're not pioneering, if you're only close following. It has some advantages. But it has some disadvantages too. And um, I like the customer obsession model. I think it's the right one. I think it's better than product obsession even. I think product obsession is not bad, but I think customer obsession gets you there in a healthier way. Um, uh, so that's one of, the, uh, one of the principles, one of the approaches that we take in every single thing that we do. The second one is that we are uh, willing, I would say even eager, to invent and pioneer. So that is, um, I think that goes along, it marries really well with customer obsession. Customers are always dissatisfied, they, even when they don't know it, even when they think they're happy, they actually do want a better way, and they just don't know yet what that should be. And that's why I always warn people, customer obsession is not just listening to customers. Customer obsession is also inventing on their behalf, because it's not their job to invent for themselves. And so you need to be an inventor and a pioneer. And the third one that's really central to the way we think about all of our business uh, problems and a, and a bunch of things at Amazon is we're long-term oriented. So I uh, ask everybody to not think in two to three year time frames, but to think in five to seven year time frames, to not think about, when somebody says to me, congratulates Amazon on a good quarter, um, which is a very common thing to say. You meet somebody, they're being nice. They looked at your financial results for the quarter, they're like, good quarter. I say, thank you. But what I'm thinking to myself is that quarter, all that, those quarterly results were actually pretty much fully baked about three years ago. And so like today, I'm working on, you know, uh, a quarter that is going to happen in 2020, not next quarter. Next quarter, uh, for all practical purposes, is done already. And it's probably been done for a couple of years. Um, and so if you start to think that way, um, it changes how you spend your time, how you plan, um, where you put your energy, um, and, and your ability to look around corners gets better. So many things improve if you can take a long term. And by the way, it's not natural for humans. So it's a, it's a discipline that you have to build. The, um, the kind of, you know, uh, get rich slowly schemes are not big sellers on uh, infomercials. You know, it's... Uh, and so that's something that you have to sort of steal yourself for and discipline and teach um, uh, over time. So the, that's what is Amazon? I would say really it's a collection of principles and, and it's an approach that we deploy um, and, uh, uh, and it's fun. I dance into work. <laughs> Me too. I'm not a good dancer though. <laughs> I mean, get, get, rich, get Rich Slowly is, as a book I probably should have gotten instead of the screenplay book. But, um. By the way, you know, um, I, one of our award recipients earlier mentioned that you mentioned that you were happy you got rid of your bangs. M me too. Yeah, I, <laughs> I hated my bangs. So <laughs> clearly, clearly you do not take uh, the success of Amazon lightly and you're very involved in the company. And one of the great things about the internet, many of your competitors are in this room tonight and competitions a click away. There are probably people in garages across the country trying yeah. to start the next great internet company like you did. For sure. Uh, and so what does keep you up at night when you think about the continued success of Amazon? Well, f first of all, I, I, I'm gifted with sleeping really well. So uh, the, met the particular metaphor doesn't work for me, but I, I know what you mean, which is what could go wrong and what are you worried about? And, and um, for me, uh, the thing I worry about the most is that we would lose our way in one of those things, that we would lose our, uh, our obsessive focus on customers or would somehow become short-term oriented or would you know, um, start to become overly cautious 
you know, kind of failure averse and therefore unable to invent and pioneer. You cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. To, to, to invent, you need to experiment. And if, it's, if you know in advance that it's going to work, it is not an experiment. And so that's a very important thing. You, you know, it's a, the, they are inseparable twins, failure and invention. And so you have to be willing to do that. And it's embarrassing to fail. Um, you know, it's always embarrassing to fail. But you have to say, no, that's not how this works. If I said to you, you have a 10% chance of a, a, with a particular decision, a 10% chance of a 100x return, you should take that bet every time. But you're still going to be wrong 9 out of 10 times. And it's going to feel bad 9 out of 10 times. And in, 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 with technology, the outcomes, the results can be very long-tailed. The, it's very, the payoff is, can be very asymmetric, which is why you should do so much experimentation. You know, pe everybody knows that if you swing for the fences, you hit more home runs, but you also strike out more. But with the baseball, that analogy doesn't go far enough because with baseball, no matter how well you connect with the ball, you can only get four runs. The success is capped at four runs. But in business, every once in a while, you step up to the plate and you hit the ball so hard, you get a thousand runs. And so when, that, when you have that kind of asymmetric payoff and you know, one, at, one at back can get you a thousand runs, it encourages you to experiment more. It's the right business decision to experiment more. It's also better for your customers. Customers like um, the successful experiments. By the way, this is a, a giant misconception in um, a lot of young entrepreneurs, inexperienced entrepreneurs that they meet. One of the things that is very fashionable right now is to talk about how disruptive their business plan is going to be. And, um, the, but invention is not disruptive. Only customer adoption is disruptive. At Amazon, we've invented a lot of things that customers did not care about at all. And believe me, they were not disruptive to anyone. So it's only when customers like the new way that anything becomes disruptive. Um, and so really, it's just saying that you want to, you know, if somebody comes to you with a business plan that they claim is disruptive, you should ask them to explain it to you in simpler language. And the simpler language is, why are customers going to adopt this? Um, why are they going to like it? Why is it better um, than the traditional way? So, so along those lines, we have you know, some press and media in, in the room. Is there something that you think um, people get wrong about Amazon that surprises you when you read about it or see it in media coverage? Well, wrong, uh, I don't know about wrong. First of all, we've been over 20 years on balance treated very fairly by the media and uh, you know, not every story that's ever been written about us is the way we would have written it if we were writing it ourselves. But, but, but on balance, very fairly treated. Um, and uh, I, you know, so wrong might be too strong. I think there, there's a piece of our business which is probably not fully um, appreciated, the scale of it and what's happening and the energy and the dynamism around it, which is the third party seller part of our business. So, you know, um, we have today roughly half of the company really is third party sales. It's small businesses. There are 100,000 businesses on Amazon where the businesses make $100,000 or more a year. Um, and it's, it's turned into, you know, a gigantic service for them. We even let them stow their products in our fulfillment centers so that their products become prime eligible, which increases their sales. And uh, a lot of people make their living. Um, on that, uh, you know, that way. And we've sort of, we've extended that into other areas too. We have a, uh, a platform called Kindle Direct Publishing, so authors can write books and then publish them directly, and that's become very successful. So there are Actually, a lot of, of authors our, one making... One of our employees have done that. Chris Hooten, our economist, has a book published on that. Right, it's very good. and, it, and it's, it's, we get, and people make, they make livings. I mean, there are people who, I have so many um, emails from authors saying, I, you know, because of this program, I've been able to quit my job. And they usually come, they already have like 25 rejection letters from traditional publishers. Um, and uh, because their book didn't fit in a category or didn't seem right and so on, but readers disagreed. And so, so one of the things that you get when you let people, um, when you, you know, I think of this as more like gardening. You kind of, 
get all the nutrients right in the soil, and then you see what comes up. And that's what happens with these third-party businesses. You know, we, do, we don't plan which books people are going to write. We just provide a service that makes it really easy for them to contact and reach readers. And then they create, these, they create new things. Same thing with Amazon Web Services. You know, we create a set of tools, and then you know, software developers and companies that employ software developers, they figure out surprising and amazing things to build with these tools. And so empowering these third parties to do things is probably starting with our third party sellers and uh, uh, authors and, um, and AWS, probably, probably the biggest thing that most, I would say, consumers probably don't appreciate about Amazon. And good investors understand it very well. Love that. Um, he's clapping, OK. Uh, so, ten, so 10 years ago, you, you mentioned AWS. So that your, Amazon has changed so much in 10 years. 10 years ago, you're barely in cloud computing. Yeah. Certainly not we doing. We just started in cloud computing. Just started computing it. Years certainly ago. not doing. Another overnight success. I've noticed all overnight successes take about 10 years. That's the right, that's the right amount yeah. of time, probably. So we're five years away as a. Yeah, you start something yeah. and just start yeah. the clock. Any, any year now. Um, so Amazon's changed so much over, over that period of time. Can you preview or predict maybe what Amazon's going to look like 10 years from now? Well, um, that's a very good question. I think on the outside, you know, kind of, you know, the observable Amazon could change quite a bit. Just as you said, there, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't think that AWS would be such a significant uh, uh, contributor to the business. And there could be more things like that in a kind of 10-year time frame that we don't know about. Um, the one thing I hope will not change, of course, is that approach that I outlined at the beginning. You know, the customer obsession, the willingness to invent, the patience, letting things develop, uh, uh, accepting failure um, uh, as a path to getting success. Um, by the way, one thing I should point out about failure, and this is a fine point, internally we take it, uh, we know it, and we don't need to talk about it much, but there's a different kind of failure which is not what you want. That's where you have operating history, and you do know what you're doing, and you just screw it up. So that's not a good failure. That's not an experiment. That's just bad operations, operational excellence. And so like, if we're, we've opened 130 fulfillment centers, we're on generation eight of our fulfillment center technology. If we open a new fulfillment center and just woof it, you know, we have to do some internal examination. That's not an experiment. That's just bad execution. So there's different kinds of failure, and you need to make sure you're making the right kind of failure. The right kind of failure should be an invention. It should be something that, you know, it's an experiment. You don't know if it's going to work, and you know up front that you don't know if it's going to work. That shouldn't be opening a new fulfillment center for us. I'm not sure I answered your question. I got distracted by failure. Um, it's okay. I've lived so comfortably with failure for so long that I, you know, I revert there on a dime. You know. it's, an, it's an important distinction, though, between the two. It is. Yeah. So, oh, but the, the uh, things that will stay the same over 10 years, the, hopefully the approach will stay the same. And then the other thing I would advise any entrepreneur or large business or large organization, um, you know, like a government organization, is you, you need to identify your big ideas. And there should only be two or three of them. And then if a senior leader, the, the main job of a senior leader is to identify two or three important ideas and then to enforce great execution against those big ideas. And the good news is that the big ideas are usually incredibly easy to identify. You shouldn't need to think about them very much. You already know what they are. Let me give you an example. For Amazon, the consumer business, um, the three big ideas are low prices, fast delivery, and vast selection. You don't need you know, it's not the kind, you know, I, in the, way, the, the way you know that they're the big ideas is because they're so obvious. The big ideas should be obvious. And by the way, it's very hard to maintain a firm grasp of the obvious at all times. So little things can distract you from the obvious. But you have to back up and say, these are the three big ideas. How do we always deliver things a little faster? How do we always reduce our cost structure so that we can have prices that are a little lower? And the good thing about these big ideas is they will be stable in time. So I know for a fact that 10 years from now, customers are still going to like low prices. No matter what happens with technology and everything else, no matter what happens, people are going to like faster delivery. It is impossible for me to imagine a scenario where 10 years from now, 
a customer comes to me and says, Jeff, I love Amazon. I just wish you delivered a little more slowly. <laughs> this is so inconceivable that you, have, you can have great conviction as a leader to continue to put energy into driving speed of delivery. And whatever you're, you know, in AWS, I know that customers, they like low prices, they like availability, they don't want the services to be down, they like data security. It's not very hard to figure out what the big ideas are, and then you can keep putting energy into those things. And you spin up those flywheels, and they'll still be paying you dividends 10 years from now. And what I'm saying, I'm putting it in kind of a business context, but for those of you who are, are in government, these principles would apply identically identically to a government organization. You should figure out what the big ideas are and just spin up flywheels. Get those things rolling. Make sure that you've picked things that will still be true 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So on big ideas, uh, artificial intelligence is something that I think has captured the imagination of Washington and, and probably the rest of the country and world. What is, what is Amazon's approach to artificial intelligence? Well, first of all, this is uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial intelligence, this is, it is a renaissance. It is a golden age. We are now solving problems with machine learning and artificial intelligence that were, you know, kind of in the realm of science fiction for the last several decades. And uh, natural language understanding, machine vision problems, it really is, a, it is a, an amazing uh, renaissance. And for decades, um, AI researchers kind of struggled and made very, very slow progress. And over the last 10 years, it, you know, it looks like one of those S-curves. You're just making a lot of progress very rapidly over the last 10 years. Um, the, it, machine learning and AI is a horizontal enabling layer. It will empower and improve every business, every go government organization, every uh, philanthropy. Every, basically, there's no institution in the world that cannot be improved with machine learning. So at Amazon, you know, some of the things we're doing are super obvious. So um, they're kind of superficially obvious, and they're, and they're interesting, and they're cool, and you should pay attention to them. I'm thinking about things like uh, Alexa and Echo, you know, our, our voice assistant. I'm thinking about our autonomous primary uh, delivery drones. Um, those things use a tremendous amount of machine learning, machine vision systems, natural language understanding, um, and a bunch of other techniques. And those, um, uh, but those are kind of the, the showy ones. And I would say a lot of the value that we're getting from machine learning is actually happening, you know, kind of beneath the surface. And it is things like improved uh, search results, uh, improved product recommendations for customers, improved forecasting for inventory management, and, and, and literally hundreds of other things beneath the surface. And then I'd say the most exciting thing um, that I think we're working on in machine learning is that we are determined to, through Amazon Web Services, where we have all these um, customers who are corporations and software developers, to make these advanced techniques accessible to um, every organization, even if they don't have kind of the current class of expertise that's required. Right now, Deploying these techniques for your particular institution's problems is difficult. It takes a lot of expertise, and so you have to go compete for the very best PhDs in machine learning and get them, and it's, it's difficult for a lot of organizations to win those competitions. And so we're in a great position because of the uh, success of Amazon Web Services to be able to put energy into uh, making those techniques easy and accessible. Uh, and so we're determined to do that. I think we can build a great business doing that for ourselves, and it would be incredibly enabling for organizations that want to use these, uh, these sophisticated technologies to improve their own organizations. We have quite a few uh, policymakers and elected officials and, and people from the administration here, so I'd be remiss that not to ask, um, how do you uh, interface with the administration, and how are you working with elected officials in general? Well, I think probably the, probably the in, uh, pretty normal, the normal ways, we have a fantastic uh, public policy organization here. You guys already met Brian, um, Jay Carney. We have a bunch of people here in Washington. We've, you know, over time we've grown that group. Um, we also do things at the state uh, level. We're doing a little bit at certain municipal levels too. 
Um, we work hard at it. Um, it's really important to work hard at it. You can't just pretend that one, you know, that everything is, that people know everything and that you don't have to educate them. And, uh, and we try to stay, I would say the main thing we try to do, um, and I think we're pretty good at it, is stay very issues focused. So we try to stay, you know, um, on the things that are specific to Amazon and our, our customers and our employees. And, and not try to, we don't need to have an opinion. As a company, our employees are, are free to have opinions about every issue they choose to have an opinion about. Um, uh, they can have opinions about anything they want. I, I feel like Amazon needs to be a little more, uh, you know, laser focused than that on things that are uh, important to our customers or to our employees as a, as a group. And so we, I think we, our, our team does that. They keep us very disciplined in that way. I agree. I think you have a great team, and just between us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. cover your ears, Brian. Yeah. Don't. Not for don't not. <laughs> get all the blushing. Since he's, we're off he, the record, he's actually turning red. It's, <laughs> um, I have a couple, a few more questions. I know we're running out of time, and so you you had mentioned at a shareholders meeting maybe last year, or the previous year, um, about how Amazon's going to use its scale for sustainability yeah. and environment. Do you have anything you want to uh, preview? Yeah, or we. Update um, on that? So you know, for us, this is um, uh, we have uh, done a couple of things that I think uh, where I think everybody inside the organization is very proud of, and, and uh, it's been hard work, but it's it's paying off. And we have a program called Frustration Free Packaging. We've been working on for roughly 10 years. And it's a simple idea, but incredibly hard to execute. We go to manufacturers and we say, look, you are producing this thing in a four color printed package with a cellophane window and lots of twisty wire ties, or worst case, the, what do they call those things? The clamshell packaging, where they seal it in indestructible plastic. And, uh, you know, I actually looked it up. There is a um, Wikipedia entry for um, packaging rage or something like that. There's a term <laughs> for this. And that, that Wikipedia entry has um, the number, I don't remember the number now, but it's thousands. The number of people who go to the emergency room per year trying to open that indestructible um, bubble packaging. That, and, um, but why do people, why do manufacturers put things in that packaging? that kind of packaging, it's not cheap. That packaging is expensive, it's hard to recycle, um, it has a bunch of flaws, but it shows off the product well. So that when it's hanging on a, a hook in a store shelf or something, as you walk by, you can actually see the product because it's sealed in clear plastic. And of course at Amazon, that doesn't matter at all. You know, we're, you're, we're gonna show you great pictures of the product and videos of the product and customer reviews of the product. The product can be sealed in a tiny little cardboard box that's easy to open. And, um, uh, and so we started this program and, and we, we teach people how to make internet packaging that is uh, very efficient, easy to recycle, easy to open. And uh, we, this, uh, something like, um, just in the past year, we have saved 55,000 tons of waste uh, as a result of this program. The, um, and, And we have gone, uh, we have now started putting solar cells on the roofs of all of our fulfillment centers. We're doing 15 this year. These are big fulfillment centers. There are, they're about a million square feet each. And uh, so we're covering them with solar cells. That'll, that'll cover about 80% of the fulfillment center's uh, energy budget on an annual basis. We have built, we are the largest purchaser in the world, the largest uh, corporate purchaser in the world of renewable energy. Um, and I don't know, I'll screw up the figure because I can't remember, it's something like 3.6 million megawatt hours per year. Of, we've built solar farms and solar wind farms. Uh, uh, and so it's, you know, we keep just rolling this out and we have a goal long term of being completely uh, renewable. So it'll take a long time. But the good news is, these are, uh, these are not only great for uh, the, you know, the environment, they're good business decisions too. You know, the, the technologies have improved to build a solar farm or a wind farm now. You're, you know, it, 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 you're, these are um, competitive technologies uh, with natural gas powered plants and other things. So you can actually do it and, 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 and feel like you're making a sensible business decision. So I think a lot of companies will do this in the future. I think they should do it. So we're, we're having fun with all of that. 
I have, I have one final question that I, that I have to ask you as we're uh, running out of time. It's a, a shared passion of ours. I went to space camp as a child, and, and you have a rocket company. I knew I liked you right away. Yeah. yeah. So we have so much, we have so much yeah. in common. So Anybody who goes to space camp is my kind of person. Yeah. That's, uh, don't, don't, yeah, that's fine. That's between yeah. us, too. Um, so your rocket company, Blue Origin, yeah. is really taking off, doing well. How do you see um, that company you know, evolving in the future, future of space, anything well, you want to share on Blue Origin? So, okay, first of all, I love space. I have been a space lover since I was a five-year-old boy. And I feel like I won the lottery with Amazon. I know I won the lottery. And, uh, and now I'm investing those lottery winnings in Blue Origin, which is uh, the space company. Um, we, built, we're built, we are flying a, a suborbital tourism vehicle, and we'll start taking people up hopefully in 2018. That's coming right up. Working on it for more than 10 years. Uh, uh, hopefully, this, one, this, this overnight success is taking longer than 10 years. I don't know. We'll see. You know. uh, and we're also building an orbital vehicle called New Glenn. New Shepard is named it for Alan Shepard, the first American in space. He went on a suborbital journey. New Glenn is named after the American hero, John Glenn, who uh, was the first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, and so uh, these are both, these are reusable uh, boosters, fully reusable. That's the key to lowering the cost. Our vision at Blue Origin is that we want millions of people living and working in space. And my personal hope is that I live long enough to see um, the kind of dynamism in space. I want to see a whole economy, entrepreneurs in space that I got to witness over the last 20 years on the internet. You know, um, the, the problem with being an entrepreneur in the space arena is that the price of admission is so darn high. So, it, you know, to do interesting things in space, the beginning, you know, kind of the beginning entry level is a few hundred million dollars. So you're not going to get, you know, two kids in their dorm room doing something amazing in space. Whereas, that's literally what happened to Facebook, right? So on the internet, because the price of admission is so low, you can get these amazing experiments where like one kid in a dorm room does something and it turns into Facebook. And, or, you know, Amazon's case, you know, I started this thing with an incredibly small amount of capital and the, you know, it was able to grow because we didn't need a lot to get to, to begin with. The heavy lifting was in place for Amazon, right? So I didn't need to build a transportation network it existed already. It was UPS and the Royal Mail and the US Postal Service and Deutsche Post and so on and so on. I didn't have to build a telecommunications backbone to connect with my customers. It was there. It was called the internet. And in fact, the internet was resting on top of the long distance phone network at that time. You guys remember the dial up modem? Some of you do. Some of you were too young to. You, some of you should go to a museum and see a dial up modem. What was that sound? And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so. I, want, I, I recently showed a group of youngsters a payphone. I came across one, and I was like, my god, guys, come over here. This may be the last one. You have to see it. Um, and uh, so, you know, the point is that Amazon was, got to rest on top of, we didn't have to build a payment system. It already existed. It was called the credit card. Um, computers were already on every desk, thanks to you know Microsoft, IBM, and Apple. And you know, but what were they being used for? To play games, not to buy things on Amazon. And so all that heavy lifting was in place. And I want to, you know, my greatest. Uh, 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 I would have such a good feeling if I could be an 80-year-old guy and laying there thinking about my life. If I could say, look, there is um, now a bunch of entrepreneurs in space because. I took my Amazon lottery winnings and built the heavy lifting infrastructure that does take billions of dollars in capex to lower the cost of access to space. That's how you get millions of people living and working. And by the way, we need that. For those of you who like to think about the future at all, um, you can do a simple calculation. You know, we, we can argue about um, you know, what limited resources on Earth and so on and so on. But here's a calculation that you cannot argue with which is you take current baseline energy usage on Earth, compound it at just a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, 
and you have to cover the entire surface of the earth in solar cells. So you have to, we're going to have to decide, do we want a society of pioneering, invention, expansion, growth, or do we want a society of stasis? And personally, I believe, because the earth is finite, and if you want a society of stasis, I think it's good. First of all, I don't personally believe that stasis is even compatible with freedom. So I think for me, that's a big problem. Second of all, it's going to be dull. Stasis is going to be very dull. You don't want to live in the stasis world. And so, of course, we're going to continue to get more efficient, too. We have been. For hundreds of years, we've been getting more productive, more efficient. That's, that trend is going to continue. Um, but even so, we're going to want to use more energy, more energy per capita. And also, I don't want to stabilize population. I would love for there to be a trillion humans in the solar system. With a trillion humans, we would have a thousand Einsteins and a thousand Mozarts. It'd be an incredible symbol. Don't you want that dynamism? It'd be so much more interesting. My, this is for your great, great, great grandchildren. But what kind of world do you want them to live in? I, I want them to live in that expansive world that is you know, uh, learning more about the universe and moving out throughout the solar system. So that we have to do it. And um, anyway, so it's fun to work on that. And, uh, 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 you know, I, I get, I, I have a, a, I won so many lotteries in my life. Um, I have the best parents in the world. My mom, uh, Jackie, and my dad, Mike. My mom had me when she was 17 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She was still in high school. It was not cool. Um, and she did an amazing job. My dad, Mike, is a Cuban immigrant who came here when he was 16 without his parents. Did an amazing job. So those are the things that are your little gifts in life. You get, sometimes you get, my greatest admiration, by the way, is withheld for those people, and I know several of them, who had terrible parents and still somehow made it through. That's hard. Um, that was, I had the opposite, so I got lucky. Well, thank you, Jeff. Let's have a round of applause for Jeff Bezos. Thank you for joining us at Internet Association's 2017 Internet Freedom Awards Charity Gala. Proceeds from this event will benefit STEM programming at After School All-Stars. 